Tony, I would then invite Ms. Justina Mkoko, the chairperson of um, the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum, to officially launch the report so that we can engage in the upcoming reflections. Over to you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Human Rights Forum has been in existence for more than 20 years. And I'd like to preface the comments about the research with a small reflection about where we are today. Um, the Human Rights Forum came together uh, after some preliminary discussions in 1997 as the country seemed to be blossoming into a new culture of human rights. And the discussion between the Amani Trust, uh, the Legal Resources Foundation and the Catholic Commission was that we should have a forum. There should be a place where people came and talked about human rights. And that idea cooked a little bit in 1997. And then in December 1998, uh, things changed really radically with the food riots. And we had, for the first time, on the streets in our country, soldiers. That we had not seen them in this particular way uh, at all for nearly 18 years and people were shot and, and terrible things happened during a week. And a small group of organizations got together uh, and that was the beginning of what is now called the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum. Um, and since that time, the forum and all its members have produced literally hundreds of reports on the human rights situation in Zimbabwe. I, I hate to guess how many it is, but the forum itself, for nearly eight years, produced a political monthly violence report detailing what happened every single month. And there were reports from all sorts of organizations affiliated to the forum, as well as many international organizations. What was very important about that first beginning was the formation of a very fine collaboration between the human rights organizations of Zimbabwe. Um, that small group uh, came together and worked very hard. And out of that work, a large network grew of 20 odd organizations. It led to the formation of the National Transitional Justice Working Group with something like 100 stakeholders. And what they, that, that, that process over the years developed were some very, very fine tactics in dealing with an authoritarian state and with gross human rights violations. One of the first things that we did, and we'll be talking about it a lot this morning, was extremely fine documentation. Documentation by lawyers, by doctors, by psychologists, by all sorts of people. So that was very important. The documentation meant that the reports were based on empirical fact. Uh, allied to that was the help given to victims through what was then the Amani Trust, now uh, Counseling Services Unit, the Tree of Life. Uh, we put our money where our mouth is in the members of the forum to make sure this is not purely documentation, but we give help. And we invented a whole new tactic in the world of human rights challenge, and that was the use of civil suits, of legal suits. When the government refuses to investigate gross human rights violations, what you do is you find another route. And beginning with the food riots, uh, the forum and its members uh, went to court on behalf of the victims. And there have been thousands of cases filed. And what has come out of that is the civil suits, which are slow, laborious, and expensive, validate in the courts all the uh, uh, accusations and allegations that we make. And there was massive advocacy. much uh, pride we can have in the work of the Human Rights Forum, but most important, it is the confidence we can have in the data that we're able to look at and to reach conclusions. Now, the current report is basically got two main objectives. One was to create a baseline going forward. Where are we today and what changes over time as we go forward? And the second thing is to reflect upon the last year and what has changed 
what has improved and what has worsened. Now there are three main sections to the report. Uh, one is uh, a very brief analysis of the current context where we've gone from the change in November 2017 to today, more or less. The second thing is an analysis of violence, because this has been a preoccupation and is one of the major tasks of the forum, is to document violence. And the third is to look at the adherence to constitutionalism. Now, the current context I'm not going to spend much time on. Um, you know, I, I think as Calvin pointed out, there's a hell of a lot of uh, uh, common understanding of what has happened from November to now. But I just want to raise uh, four basic issues that I think are key. The first is the actual transition that happened in November and the confusion at the particular time about what that event was. Was that a military assisted transition of changing the bums on the seat within a political party or was it a coup? And that was a very important issue right at that particular time and it has ramifications uh, going forward. The second thing was an election. And what was key about the coup was that curing the coup was dependent utterly and completely on an election that everybody could put their hands on their heart and say a government has been elected in a free and fair election without contest. Uh, the third issue was the violence that took place in the immediate aftermath of the election. And the fourth was the violence that took place at the beginning of these years. Uh, they are all very, very important singular events, and they also have legal ramifications, as hopefully when we get to talking about constitutionalism, we will raise. Uh, but where we stand, in some, in Zimbabwe today, is in probably a society that is more deeply polarized than at any time since 1980. And what is key about that polarization is that uh, one of the commodities that societies depend upon utterly and completely is political trust. Uh, Rao has just recently done some research looking at political trust. And political trust is terribly important because it, it's part of a synergistic relationship between the trustworthiness of the, of the state and the government and the political trust that the citizens have in the government. It's a dance between the two. And considerable research shows that uh, the key issue in the trustworthiness of the government is whether the government trusts its citizens. And I think you need to keep that in your head. Does the government trust its citizens? Uh, and if it does, and it delivers the kinds of things that citizens expect, well then citizens develop political trust in the government. Now what this research shows is it is not merely a question today to say citizens have a lack of political trust in the government. It has been the case since 1999. And that was part of the reason for prefixing my remarks about 1998. Something broke in 1998 between the government and the citizens. And every single year, and this data was based on the Afrobarometer, and the Afrobarometer asked nice questions about do you trust the president, Zek, Zes, um, Zimra, etc., etc., etc. If you construct a measure of that, you find that the majority of Zimbabweans do not deeply trust the government and have not since 1999. So we can go back and discuss some of those issues later, but let's move to the violence. Now, in doing this baseline study, it, we felt it was very important that we had as empirical and quantitative an analysis as we possibly can. That we could test data. Not merely just report it, but we could test it. In order to do that, we made use of something called the ACLED database. The Armed Conflict Local Events Database. It's, it's a marvelous database, and the people who run it in the United Kingdom look at armed conflict across the world. Not just in Zimbabwe, they're looking at Sudan, every place that has armed conflict, and they collect information on it. They collect it, uh, they uh, clean it according to certain codes, and you're therefore able to see what the pattern is in any particular country, and you can look at it over time. For Zimbabwe, ACLED has 11 
thousand entries. It's a lot of data. And that's all organized by what are the events, who are the actors, who are the victims, uh, where did it happen? <clears throat> and much more data than that. It's an enormous amount of data. What's really special about Zimbabwe, and another reason why I said we should feel proud of the forum, is that the entries in that database, 64% of them come from the forum and its members. That's extraordinary. And I, we did a little exercise recently, and we contrasted a few other countries, Angola, Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia, and South Africa. What was fascinating was that Zimbabwe was distinct in the sense that the database was constructed by human rights reports, by lawyers, by medical examination, etc. In most other countries, they constructed from press reports. Now, that's not to be critical of the press, but a press report is very different from a survivor giving a legal affidavit and being examined by people. So this is hard data. So we did three contrasts. We looked at 98 to 2019, to April 2019. We then looked at a thorny issue in Zimbabwe that comes up all the time. What is the relationship with elections? And then the final contrast was to look at uh, two periods of time in contrast. That was 2013 after the election to November 2017, and then from November 2017 to April 2019. Now, so from 98 to 2019 on 11,000 entries. Uh, who are the victims? Well, 76% of them are civilians. It's what you might expect. It's not a country at war. This is not the liberation struggle. Soldiers are not fighting each other. The victims are <coughs> civilians. Who are the perpetrators? That's interesting. 40% of them were civilians also. Now, that could have been deconstructed, but on 11,000 entries, there was insufficient time to go and look at every single entry and look at the narrative and say, what did that report say? Who was that particular perpetrator? Were they MDC, ZANU PF, who, who? That wasn't done. 33% in that period of time were either the Zimbabwe Republican police or supporters of ZANU PF. 5% of those 11,000 were the military. And most interesting, 40% of the reports came from Harare. Right? Well, we have this idea that everything happens all over the country. Well, actually, a hell of a lot happens in Harare. And there's good reasons for that. We then looked at elections. And we com compared election years with others. Now, that's been done before. The forum has had reports out before based on its existing data. And it's looked at the differences between elections and, and non-elections. And generally, the finding has been that there's more violence during election times than there is during non-election times. Uh, this time around, we did a slightly different analysis. We took a year in which an election happened, and we contrasted them with years in which there were no elections. Now, the rationale for that is that very often, an election year is not when they declare the election open and you have three months. It starts a long way before. Some of us can remember that the campaign for the presidential election in 2002 actually started in, in December 2000 with the by-elections and rolled out through the farm invasions. So that was a hell of a long lead for an election that was going to be very important. When we did this contrast, there were very clear statistical findings and very robust findings indeed. When it comes to elections, the violence is against civilians with sexual violence, attacks, arrests, and abductions. Uh, the perpetrators there are civilians, ZANU PF, the CIO, and the MDC. Elections are also conflicts between political parties. We would be unsurprised with that finding. There are no saints overall, but some, some sinners may be grosser sinners than others. When it came to non-elections, the actors were militia, the ZRP, the military, protesters, and rioters. It's a big difference in who's operating at these particular times. And there were associations that went with them. When you looked at non-elections, the strongest association, because I made the comment about Harari, was that 
that the, perp the actions took place in urban areas. When it was elections, they took place in rural areas. I'm, I'm sure looking at the Zimbabweans here, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. <laughs> Is that right? Right. So two different patterns emerge when you look at that period uh, over election. Of, of violence. One is violence that's associated with elections and the other is violence that I would say is with controlling urban space. Those are the different patterns. So violence is not exclusively confined to elections. It's happening at different times and for different reasons and because of different threats. All right, now you get to the crunchy bit because that's where the title is. <laughs> They're all on tenterhooks. Is it any different? So as I said, we compared 2013 to November 2017 and November 2017 to April 2019. What was startling and statistically significant in the most robust fashion is that almost every uh, event, every kind of, of, of violation has worsened since November. Abductions, arrests, attacks, looting and property destruction, mob violence, sexual violence, violent demonstrations, battles, riots, and violence against civilians. And within that, what was really fascinating was this term battles, fights going on between people, was absolutely associated with violence against civilians. So you can see what the pattern looks like. The perpetrators rioters, military, and militia, uh, to some extent the police. But what was disturbing was to see this enormous increase in civilian participation in violent events. This is no shock to anybody else. And if you looked at that period, all the violence was much worse in Harare. So what you see in this period is an increase in violations. You see this increase, a great increase in the participation of the military and this issue of civilians being involved in it. Now, I would suggest that's a very deeply disturbing finding. And in the context of deteriorating livelihoods, extreme hardship, the frustrations and the despair of people, this shows an extremely worrying situation indeed. Right? And, you know, one of the factors is that many of those, uh, of those civilians involved in it the, the demo demographic profile was that they were young and male. Right? And I'm sure all of you understand our population, 70% under the age of 35, a massive youth bulge. There's evidence all across the world that when you get large youth bulges in the, in the context of economic decline and an unresponsive government, expect an increase in crime, expect an increase in civil disturbance, and even in some places, civil war. And I don't think I have to point out what's happened in Sudan to everybody. So the violence was distressing. And I think that we can say conclusively from that evidence, based on solid stuff, that things did not get better. Zimbabwe is a more violent place than it was two years ago. The second area to look at, and this is a section in the report that should have been about, I don't know, 60 pages. <laughs> You've got to be reasonable in a report that's for general consumption. This was to look at the adherence to constitutionalism. Calvin made the point at the beginning that coming in to power the new government, people just to come and dig up our minerals, but to create, recreate the relationships with those international institutions that we would be confident in. So what could they have done? Well, how about ratifying the Convention Against Torture? I mean, some of you may not know, but Parliament many years ago said, ratify it. It's, it's, an ob it's an obligation under the Constitution. The government must ratify these things, all international conventions, okay? And they must domesticate them. Well, Parliament said they should. The President just at that time declined to sign it into power. A very good commitment to being a good international partner would be to ratify, sign and ratify and domesticate CAT. It would be a very good thing, having seen what's coming out of South African courts, that the withdrawal from SADC, the South African courts ruled, is ultra-virus the South African constitution. 
a good commitment would be to say, let's bring it back. Let's be a good citizen of SADC. This is a way in which we can hold ourselves to be accountable in our peer countries. And as for Cotonou, it seemed to be moving along quite nicely. We're heading towards a discussion about Article 9 and how we will restore good governance, uh, rule of law and human rights. And the moment the EU raises the issue about how those might be being violated, they're told to mind their own business. And that looks to me, overall, as if we're moving back, back to the pre-coup uh, process of, of Zimbabwe, which is to be completely internationally isolated once again, but only within the lager of SADC, who seem to be parsimoniously happy with everything that happens here. A couple of final points, and, and this is really to look at uh, the independent commissions. I made the point about why Montlante and not the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and the point about trustworthiness of government. If government does not trust its own independent institutions, but bypasses them, what political trust will the citizens and the international community have that they are concerned to be uh, constitutionally compliant? And you can see there's been a series of decisions by the Human Rights Commission which in very difficult circumstances, and we might add, gets a clean bill of health from the Auditor General, right? They spend their money wisely. They have done extremely good independent research, okay? On the riots, on the violations against teachers, they've made recommendations. These recommendations are ignored by the state and in fact, when they come up with findings that suggests excessive use of force in, in, in the riots, they are actually attacked by the government. So, a good functioning institution is trashed. Contrast that then with the NPRC, which itself struggles uh, with resources, with the tidiness of government in uh, uh, composing the commission correctly inappropriately uh, uh, electing a, a chairperson who was not entitled to be there, uh, uh, taking a very, very long time to finally pass the legislation, and credit to the current government, they did finally in produce the enabling legislation. But as work has been done by lawyers and the National Transitional work Justice Working Group, it is a very weak piece of legislation in a very weak institution, and it is it is a very important institution because while the Human Rights Commission looks forward into things that are going to happen, the NPRC looks backward at what has gone in the past. And that's the relevance of all these reports for nearly 20 years of the accountability that needs to be investigated. Um, its attempts to engage the Gukuruhundi issue have been fumbling and uh, inept, in my view. And it is of concern, and this is a debatable point, and we may debate it, their engagement with the national dialogue, is that uh, within their purview as an independent institution? Or would they have been more wise to be standing on the side and looking at all the initiatives in this deeply polarized society? The report ends with a chunk of rec recommendations. And these are recommendations for baselines. We've had baselines in the past, um, and they've slid away. So the recommendations are basically fivefold. It is critical to keep monitoring organized violence and torture. Uh, the data says we're in a serious problem, and we must continue to monitor that. We need to monitor compliance with the Constitution. Veritas and many organizations are doing it week by week, month by month, they're looking at compliance. It seems to me that that needs to be consolidated into looking at actual compliance. Little things like ministers deciding that they're entitled to make legislation when in fact they should go to parliament and ask for the regulations. Um, that's very important. We need to monitor our compliance with international standards. There are many things that we're judged by internationally and we need to monitor how well we're doing with those things. We need to monitor carefully 
how the Chapter 12 institutions are functioning. Not just the Human Rights Commission or the NPRC, but the new uh, Anti-Corruption Commission, the Media Commission, etc., etc. We need to see that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing, independently defending the Constitution within their mandate. And that's important for this issue of trustworthiness. It's important for the citizens that we, the citizens are able to trust them. And finally, what comes out of this is it's critical to start monitoring specific actors that have been involved in the organized violence. And that is particularly the Zimbabwe Republican Police and the Zimbabwe National Army. There's very careful monitoring of that has to happen. You, we hear allegations all over the place that these are not police but they're army. That needs to be found out. It is very clear that, that, that these state institutions are behaving according to the Constitution and to their legislation and they are not uh, operating in some strange third force manner. I would suggest that a way to do that is to in fact construct a barometer of those five or six areas uh, in a simple way that the citizens can see for themselves empirically and truthfully whether the government is adhering to the Constitution and producing the change that the Constitution requires. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Um, it was such an elaborate summary of the findings of the report. I was looking at the volume and the volume of the summary and I was just wondering where all that information is condensed. Um, yeah, I think basically the conclusion uh, he is making from the findings of the report is that um, I think in almost every kind of violation um, that we have experienced since uh, November 2017 to date, it appears from this analysis that uh, the violence has worsened and it's quite a worrisome trend. And this violence has been against civilians and he's also making uh, the finding that uh, there's also been an increase in the involvement of the military in the violence, openly that is, and also an increase in the participation of citizens as well uh, in violence and mainly uh, when you're looking at it from a demographic, demographic angle, the young males have also been very prominent in this. And it's quite a distressing situation that we are at at the moment. And another worrisome trend is also the, 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 the lack of constitutional, lack of adherence to constitutional obligations, as I think has been witnessed in the various episodes that he has shared with us, coupled with the slow pace in the alignment or even non-existent. I don't think by now we can still qualify it as slow pace because there is no traction at all in terms of the alignment, including even the repealing of legislation that is blatantly against the constitution, which continues to be applied even to date. Uh, I think uh, some of the worrisome trends that he has highlighted uh, includes the deployment of the military in maintaining law and order clearly against the Constitution and also their involvement in the election, which has always been a sticky issue, I think, in the, in the, in the past elections. The role of the Joint Operating Command, which is still unclear, considering that the Constitution itself has provided for some uh, mechanisms that facilitate for civilian oversight. I think I will add on to his list of some of the key outstanding issues, that is the complaints mechanism that is provided for under Section 210 of the Constitution, which is still yet to be established uh, despite its agents in, in light of our experiences of today. And of course, the international obligations which the government has clearly demonstrated contempt of. I think the events of the past week can attest to this, which is quite a huge and worrisome uh, concern. So those are, I think, in summary of the summary, <laughs> the findings that uh, Tony has just shared with us. So before we get to the reflections and an interaction with Tony's uh, uh, research findings, I would invite Justina to come and launch the report so that we can also interact with the reporters. We are interacting with the summary, brief summary that Tony has shared with us. And before Justina leaves after the launch, I would also want him, uh, sorry, want him <laughs> to share with us the, the practical implications of these findings to the ordinary citizen, because this is 
where we owe it all. What does it mean? How does it affect I know the enjoyment of the constitutional rights by ordinary citizens, the current state of affairs. Before I hand over to you, uh, I'm just reminded whenever you mention adherence to legal rules, I always um, revere the work that one of our own uh, luminaries in the legal fraternity has been doing. That is the chairperson of the National Transitional Justice Working Group, who is in our midst, uh, Alec Nchadehama. Um, thank you for being part of us today. I think he has also a lot of experience that he has in terms of fighting for the rule of law in Zimbabwe, which resonates with most of the findings that uh, Tony has just shared with us. We are happy to have you in our midst, Say, so, Thank you very much. And over to you, uh, Justina. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think there's something about people referring to me as a man. <laughs> and before this, we had a conversation, we had a meeting where the media continues to say, what is the comment of women's organizations? And the mic will be on me. And I'm looking at myself. I am a woman. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Blessing. And... Um, it gives me great honor to launch this report, and I hope that it is a report that will be useful to Zimbabweans, and in particular, um, ordinary Zimbabweans. And I think this is why we don't have a voluminous uh, edition of the report, so that it is easy for people to be able um, to go through it. So. Allow me, I haven't been given a scissors, so. The new deception, what has changed, has duly been launched. And I uh, think the report is now being distributed. And uh, while that is happening, um, I'm going to talk about the practical implications of our human rights situation as it exists now. Uh, we have been told about the Second Republic, we have been told about the new dispensation. What is new about the dispensation from what Tony has presented to us? Um, and I think the report that is before us in words, images and figures and facts uh, there's nothing new um, in relation to the new dispensation the report shows we are still fighting the same struggles against impunity and at this stage if not worse and I think that is actually quite worrying if um, we are saying that in this environment things might have slid um, more than we had anticipated um, it to be. Because what we are recognizing is that violence is organized. We have continually had about a third force or a third hand. Um, and we continue to experience abductions and kidnappings that are happening and are carefully planned to instill fear and terror in citizens. The truth is we have citizens who have been abducted, who have been tortured, um, and uh, this trend has just surged in the month of 
August. And I think what is said is that it is in this same month, on the 31st or the 30th of August, when we commemorate um, those who have been subject of enforced disappearances. And this is where we have this surge in numbers. And um, it is quite sad for us on behalf of the forum to recognize that this is happening amongst us. Um, if we look at what has been happening, we also recognize that the police remains a brutal force. The images that we have seen in the last few, um, in the last few weeks, uh, I think just over the weekend, they were going about um, hitting windscreens of motorists and also beating up citizens going about their their business. After the November 2017 military coup, uh, the police tried to cleanse itself into a service. But we are not convinced that this has really gone skin deep. I think it's still superficial and we need to see more evidence in terms of this being um, genuine uh, cleansing. Uh, and they, are, they remain a force for violence, not the maintenance of peace. And we have increasingly been concerned about the deployment of the military, which is something that Tony made reference to. Um, evidence has surfaced, and we know it very well when we look at August 2018 and also January 2019, there is evidence that the military was deployed and parliament was not informed. And this is actually cause for concern. I've already alluded to the fact that the government has spoken about a third force or a third hand. Um, but our question is, who are these people? with access to state weaponry and uh, a cut blanche to go ag ab about the country, brutalizing citizens who are supposed to be protected according to Section 52 of the Constitution, which gar guarantees the right to personal security. With a human rights record of this nature, we are worried about whether re-engagement will become a reality or it just remains a mantra that we are open for business but definitely not open for human rights. If we say Zimbabwe is open for business, we also call for human dignity first. What kind of business happens when our citizens are being abducted because they have spoken against violence or they have just demonstrated a view that is different from the status quo. And I think there are critical questions that we need to be asking ourselves. How do we build a Zimbabwe that we all want if we are not talking to each other? Who will break these barriers for us to be able to begin um, the dialogue? How do we convince the world that we have changed when we continue to see images like the images in this report and images that we continue to see on a daily basis? We hear of, polit of a political actors' dialogue. Uh, how, as Zimbabweans, can we transform from the political dialogue to one that is all-inclusive? I'm really thinking about the inclusion of victims in this regard. Because our victims tend to suffer in silence. They have gone through so much. You get someone speaking about their situation and the arrogance that you get in response to that. I think we saw it last week when people were speaking um, about the abduction of Samantha Kareni, uh, also known as Gonyeti. Uh, you could have been mistaken that probably they were not talking about a human being but some animal that was about to go extinct. And I think for us this is quite sad where we are saying that we are open for business but really no one respects 
the rights of citizens. And these rights are not just rights that people are taking from nowhere. They are guaranteed by our constitution. I think chapter four is quite elaborate in terms of those rights, but those rights continue to be um, violated on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Justina. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here we have it. Um, we've heard from Justina's sentiments on the practical implications on the ordinary citizens and the findings from Tony. So now I think in the next uh, 20 minutes, we can interact with their findings and some of the sentiments uh, by way of reflections as well. Um, if you have any questions, clarifications, as well as comments, this is the time. I will invite uh, those comments and questions. I think we can speak from wherever we are. It's, uh, it's still okay. <laughs> I don't see any. <laughs> They're in shock. Fine shock. Is that sorry? Oh, you are waving. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, Anna. <laughs> Thank you for breaking um, the ice. Thank you so much to the Human Rights Forum for the launch of this report and the interesting findings. Um, I just wanted to find out in terms of the different categories that you have in your report, like civilian protesters and so on. Is there a glossary how you define them? Because I can imagine it's quite difficult to see, okay, who, who do we define now as pure civilians who might be a member of a different party? And then there's also a differentiation between like civilians and protesters, or civilians and rioters, which I don't quite understand. Yeah. I think in, in to make it simple, one didn't want to do a, a massive statistical study. ACLED has very clear definitions for, for every single category. Um, for those who, who really want to break that down, if you go to ACLED and have a look, they have a very complex manual okay, that defines each of these things. Then, when they're um, constructing their database, of course, there are narratives for each of those things. Okay, so, for example, you might have a category of civilian protester, and then a narrative which will explain whether that person is a protester affiliated to a political party or not. Just yet. So, it's all broken down very, very carefully. It's massive. I think ideally, one should really. Uh, go the next step, which is to go through 11,000 um, narratives and tie those to each of those categories so you're able to say who is, in this case, which, who were those civilians? Were they just a group of civilians in a rural area or in town, or did this happen in the context of a battle, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's pretty complicated, but they're all specifically defined. So we just took the categories as they were and uh, did the analysis that way. Okay, thank you. Dr. Lavmo? So, I just like to comment on the accurate database. <coughs> the testify as, as about incidents rather than individuals. When they talk about the same type of incidents, they will say a villain or a visitor and say that is a cat as opposed to the number of individuals involved. So that the, the the violence is even bigger than, than is what actually is portrayed in this report, and that some of those incidents represent 30 or 40 or 50 people. So I think that's an important definition that actually didn't come out of the report, and I'm sorry to mention that. Thanks, Francis. I think that's also been the problem with all the data for the forum, which classified things according to incident. So the forum's database up until about 2009 has 40,000 incidents, but if you try and work out how many people, it could be way, way, three, four, five, six times that. So that's a good point. Thanks, Francis. Thank you. Any more questions, comments, or points of clarification? Okay, yes. yes um, thanks a lot for the presentation. Very interesting. What I missed a little bit in the recommendations was to do some further research in this significant rise in civilians being perpetrators of violence, violence and you narrowed it down to a specific group of people so it would be I think very relevant 
for the future to find out that why why this rise what is motivating people? Is it criminal forces? Is it politicization of you know of the whole situation? Or, so that would be really interesting. Yeah, I think you know it's, it's the basis for, for certainly much, much, much more research. There's no doubt that that needs to happen, uh, and that presumably can come out in the recommendations around monitoring that OBT, organized violence and torture. Okay. Sorry. You can. Sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Do you want to take it back? Take it again? Okay. You can take it again. Okay. Yeah, no, so I think the comment is, is fair. What we do need to look at is, is more detailed research. Um, that, that, I think, going forward is critical. The monitoring of organized violence and torture, mm -hmm. looking at specific actors. Mm -hmm. I think this needs to be done with, uh, with urgency, actually. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Okay. I think we are all good. <laughs> Mr. Mchadama, you are looking at me. <laughs> I can see you are itching to say something. <laughs> there he is. So I was just wondering, Tony, in respect to... You mentioned briefly about the judiciary. I think... Uh, Maybe you would to uh, have dedicated some space to talk about uh, the independence of the judiciary and the challenges that are currently being faced by people with accessing justice. Because that is also much to do with issues to do with impunity, which is also a problem that is obtaining this world. That is what I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, I knew Thanks to Alex. I completely agree with you. I think the, the issues of uh, constitutionalism require a fairly detailed report on its own. I think these were snapshots to give you an idea of the flavor, but I think, you know, looking at the court cases, the behavior of the judiciary, uh, the police in the executing of their duties rather than violence, uh, the way different state institutions are behaving, we've also got to look at in all of this as well. I mean, there are other actions where we haven't looked at. We've just recently had the Auditor General's report and the report on NASA, which are absolutely outstanding. I mean, that's a, that's a whole analysis on itself. Um, and if the, if the idea is to have the citizens informed, you know, that's very complicated research that's got to be turned into simple findings that citizens can understand. You know, how much money has gone missing? You know, there's a report today that says uh, Secundo got a million, a billion, sorry, and uh, once again, there are no receipts. You know, this stuff needs to be done. So I think there's a whole series of these things about compliance with the Constitution in its broadest terms. I think the remit here was just to look within the mandate of the forum at what the forum was set up to do, which is to look at human rights uh, in, a, in a narrower sense. But your point is, is, is taken. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more interventions. So with that, uh, I'll take this opportunity to invite Mr. Chester Samba to come forward to give us the closing remarks and a vote of thanks before we continue the deliberations over lunch. Thank you, Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, <laughs> is the report that depressing? <laughs> Um, I think uh, I'm just here to uh, really take time to appreciate the work that was put into the report, highlighting the issues that we are facing as a country. I think the call that we see from this is that we cannot remain indifferent to the issues that have just been flagged out. Um, thank you, Tony, for unpacking the report for us. Um, I would also like to thank um, members of the forum that are continuing to do the work, particularly uh, raising the flag on the issues that communities are facing uh, and documenting the challenges that uh, Zimbabweans are encountering every day. I think it's very worrying just given the extent to which uh, we face challenges as uh, the citizenry in this country. I was just looking at the pictures and the first picture got my attention I'm like, 
yeah, what, what did we do? <laughs> Why were we on the streets? But when you look at all the pictures, really, a lot of questions do come up and we need to pause and reflect on what role we are playing in the midst of all these challenges that we're facing. I'd also like to thank the um, various mission representatives that are here today um, and continuing to work with civil society in this country. Just last week, the, the president was reminding us of the role of civil society, which undoubtedly is to continue to monitor and play our watchdog role. So we need to take up his call and continue to do that. Uh, we are not going to rest. But really, um, we need to up our game more and make sure that these issues do not remain issues that are contained in the report, but we take up the task that is ahead of us. I'd also like to thank members of the forum that are here present and others, um, colleagues that have joined us to witness the launch of the report, the forum's partners, and others, I thank you for your time uh, out of your busy schedules to be with us here today. And I think we'll need to spend some time to reflect on the report before we really regroup and come together again. And hopefully we will take the recommendations in the report and act on them and be able to say we played our role as civil society. So thank you very much, Blessing and your team. Thank you. Thank you. So this marks the end of our program, and you are invited uh, for lunch. I think they are serving lunch now. Thank you very much once again.